I remember I was working on a chemical reaction called an anti-aldol reaction, which wouldn't mean anything to people who are not chemists, but it was called an anti-aldol reaction. And people couldn't do them. And there was all these rules why it would never work and it should never work, etc. And I remember one Saturday setting up a reaction and we did the reaction and I took what's called the NMR spectrum. It's like a, basically a fingerprint that comes out and it was an anti-aldol product. And it was one of those moments in life where you realize, despite the knowledge, despite the dogma, science and chemistry is going to take you places that it doesn't care about what you know or what people think. It's going to do what it wants to do. And you have to be ready to sort of jump in the, in the saddle, hold the reins on tight and go where it wants to take you. And for me, that was a tremendous lesson. I'm David McMillan. I'm a professor of chemistry here at Princeton. And this year, I won the 2021 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So I grew up in a, a tiny village called New Stevenson, which was next to a small town called Belsill. And so people keep referring to New Stevenson and Belsill, but they're part of this uh, basically steel working area, but also mining area, probably about a 10 miles away from Glasgow. And when we were growing up, it's kind of funny in America, 10 miles is nothing. You wouldn't consider that anything. But we considered that the other side of the universe to actually to go to Glasgow, which was 10 miles away. We were a, a really sort of proudly working class village, proudly working class town right next door to us. Uh, the whole area was based on coal mines. Uh, my grandparents were coal mines. My next door neighbor, who was effectively my grandfather, was a coal miner. That was about 50% of it when I was growing up. The other 50% was we had the biggest steelworks in all of Europe, which was basically a mile and a half from my house. I actually grew up between two different steelworks. So the other 50% were steel workers, and they would go off to the steelworks every day. So it was, it was a pretty working class place, but it was, you know, there was a lot, people were employed, people were working. My village would be 99% council houses. There was one or two people who owned their own house at the very outskirts of the, the village, but um, almost everyone I grew up with lived in council houses. As you've probably seen them on TV, that's where you have all the sort of houses which are in a row, and they're all sort of connected to each other, and everyone lives sort of on top of each other, which sort of looks strange when you see it, but it's actually a pretty wonderful existence. It's a fantastic place to sort of grow up, and you're just surrounded by everyone. And so in terms of a sort of community feel, it just had this really fantastic community feel. In my family, you know, the people, my family really cared about making sure you get educated. Uh, even though very working class, that's a sort of common theme in Scotland, people really do care about education. When I was a kid, I had probably no interest in science and no interest in math, or I wasn't one of these kids who was like drawing things in their, in their notebooks when they were a kid about scientific ideas. I wasn't shooting bottle rockets off from my backyard. I wish I had have been, because that I think that would have been awesome. No, I was a kid who grew up pretty, just completely consumed by things like sports and soccer and football. But for me, the, the real major influence was, was my brother. Uh, I didn't know anyone who went to college or went to uni, uh, except my brother. My brother was the first person who did that, uh, I, against my mom and dad's wishes, because uh, they thought he was just being lazy, trying to get four years without getting a job. So he went off to, to uni. And then the first day after he got out of uni with his degree, he got a job with a salary that paid more than my dad. And this really sort of was stunning to everyone. This blew away my, my parents. And from that day on, I was always being told that you need to go, you need to, go to uni, uh, specifically to do exactly what my brother had done. But, the, uh, but I think the interesting part there was it was extraordinarily important to see that, for me, to see my brother go off and do that and, and what became of him. Yeah, so I went to the University of Glasgow. That's where I went for my undergraduate degree. In terms of when did science and chemistry really begin to impact me, I would say it was in my second year, it was my sophomore year. Uh, I originally went there to do physics for a whole range of reasons, decided that wasn't going to happen. Jumped over to chemistry in, in my second year and sort of fell in love with organic chemistry, which for a lot of people will sound really weird. Uh, a lot of people think organic chemistry is particularly difficult. I, don't, I think for people who do organic chemistry, it's something that it actually becomes, it, it's, it seems very, very natural. Uh, when you first start to learn about it, it's in your mind, it sort of fits in with the way that you sort of think about problem solving as well as logic. And learning about organic chemistry was really wonderful. It was very different for me from learning about almost any other subject. And it, as I said, it was, it was a very natural sort of uptake for me to enjoy it. And especially whenever people would start to set us problems and questions, it seemed really like almost breathing, thinking about how you would sort of 
approach thinking about organic chemistry. And from that moment on, I pretty much knew I was going to be an organic chemist for the rest of my life. What is an organic chemist? An organic chemist is a chemist who thinks about studies and does research with uh, molecules that contain the atoms of life, the organic uh, aspects all around us, which is predominantly carbon, but includes hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, those kind of atoms. And it turns out all the molecules that make up our bodies, that make up the trees, make up animals, all the things around us are organic, as you might expect. And it turns out to be able to understand and think about how those molecules interact with each other or react with each other is the field of organic chemistry. One of the most beautiful things about the field of organic chemistry is it's constantly evolving and you get to play a role in that and all the organic chemists get to play a role in that every single day. For example, in the lab right now, I just came out of a meeting where we discovered a new reaction. That new organic reaction is something that many different sectors will be using probably within the next two to three weeks. For example, I'll, people we know in the pharmaceutical industry, we'll explain to them this new chemical reaction. They will see the value of it. They will start using it to help design and, and make new types of drugs. And for me, that's extraordinarily exciting, is the fact that you can find these things and evolve these ideas, but also see people adopt them very rapidly for basically applications that everyone cares about. And I think that's, that's extremely exciting. One of the reasons why so many people love being in, in the field of organic chemistry. You know, the question, how do you make a scientist? I, I don't believe there is a, a formula to make a scientist. I would say that, you know, the number one thing as a scientist is that you have to be curious and you have to care about seeing new things. If you're excited about new things, I think we all are, but if you're genuinely excited to see the next thing that's gonna happen, I think that's, that's what helps make a scientist. I say there's other things and other features which make for really good scientists. This might sound like a strange one, but generosity is really important as a scientist because you're gonna to have to be around other people and you have to give and take and share. You're gonna to have to explain to them what's going on. They have to tell you what's going on. And if you're not generous with letting them know what's available to them and what's possible for them, you're not gonna get that in a sort of responsive way either and your, your career's never gonna move forward. I always tell my wife that uh, I believe strongly in karma, not in a sort of spiritual sense, but I really do think that people who are generous, the world knows they're generous and gives it back to them fivefold. And I really do think that's an important thing for people to remember. And being generous as a scientist is an extraordinarily important attribute. Do scientists understand their career path as they're going through it? I think from my perspective, everyone does it in a different way. I really do believe that. And I think one of the parts which I think is really pretty remarkable, especially about the US, the United States system, is how it allows people from so many different paths to sort of end up in this sort of same place. And I know it seems like this sort of old cliche that America provides opportunities for people all over the world, but it's unbelievably true. It's so true, and I think people sometimes don't quite appreciate to what level the United States does that. But if you look in any lab environment, in any good research community, you will see in the US people who came here from so many different paths and through so many different journeys to get here. And I think that's, number one, that's wonderful, but number two, it's special. And I think it's the US who's singularly allowed that to happen. How do you know what your passion is and how do you know how to follow it for your career? I would say that as, you know, number one, you know what your passions are. You know what it is you do when no one's watching. Right? You know what it is, the books you pick up, the things you read, the things, you know your own curiosities. If you can somehow channel that into a career, not, it's not always possible and of course you have to be practical in some ways, but if there's an aspect of that you can take and you can channel it into your career, you know it inside, and it's, it's difficult sometimes to get out of what you are doing. There's an activation barrier associated with doing that. But if you really do sort of trust your own instincts, then it's, it's absolutely worthwhile, and I truly believe that. And taking those risks, they're not huge risks, but they're still risks, I think are really important if you really want to get to what you, you care most about and you want to use that and be part of that on a day-to-day -day basis. So what role does luck play? I think... Luck plays a very large role for anyone who ends up getting to certain um, levels that you, you know, the, the sort of barriers that you have to overcome.
But at the same time, I also believe in equal measure, uh, so a determination is also pretty important. I think you, on some level, you have to know where it is that you're wanting to get to. But to get there, you also need some level of luck. And I think people who, if they don't believe that, they're sort of kidding themselves on just a little bit. Uh, I have been, I mean, anyone who listened to me knows that I've been extraordinarily fortunate in my life. I, I certainly know that. But at the same time, I've also been reasonably determined as well. I've, as I've went along, I've sort of known there's certain parts of my life I wanted to keep sort of jumping to the next step and the next step. And I think it's always important to sort of know if a step's available to you to sort of take the step. Because uh, otherwise, you would just, at least in my view, you'd end up just spend a whole part of your life regretting having not taken, jumping to that next level. So that's something I've always believed in uh, since I went to university. How do you become aware of what your gifts are in life? That's an incredibly <laughs> difficult question. I come from a obviously slightly older generation than, than many, obviously the people who are here on campus, undergraduates and graduate students. I feel like for our generation, it was a little bit easier to sort of identify what you were good at and people, you could sort of figure your way out by seeing what you're decent at and being reasonably self-aware about what you're not good at. I think what's really, really difficult for sort of younger folks today is, and everyone will say this, but the social media aspect of there's just so much noise where people declaring themselves as being great at everything or not great at everything. And I think it's extraordinarily confusing and difficult. And it's a completely new medium and young people trying to figure out how to navigate, identifying who they are, not just to themselves, but to everyone else, is really, really tough. And so I really have a lot of um, uh, sympathy <laughs> in some ways. But you know, I also think that young people are robust and they, they do well and they figure things out and they, they get it going. And so I think uh, for most people, that self-identification process, it comes to you along the way. I don't think it's naturally uh, a light bulb moment. I think it's an awareness moment that grows in over time. But I think if you follow, this will sound cliche, but if you follow what you truly are excited about and you truly love, I think you'll get there in the end. Yeah, so science taking a, a bashing from um, recently, which I, I always find just remarkable and, and surprising, mainly because uh, I'm in a very lucky position. I won this prize, and so my situation, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I would, I would argue, for the most part. But I get to hang out with so many different scientists uh, around the world, and all those people, all those scientists, they do this out of, the, out of nobility because they care so much about trying to give back to the world and allow the world to move forward. And the idea that science is taking a bashing is like bashing the most noble people of the world who are just trying to help everyone, which I find really bizarre. If you look around what we're doing right now, every single thing that's around us right now is here for the most part because of science. And if you don't believe in science, how does all of this exist? It doesn't exist. So for me, it's, it's both unfortunate it's sad in a lot of different ways. I hope it's a pendulum that's going to swing back to where it should be. But I think the key message is, you know, scientists are noble people who really just care about the world. And I think we have to get back to that message. I'm David McMillan. It's been fun to do this interview. I hope I haven't bored you too much with some of my responses. If you ever see me around campus, please say hi. I love talking to people. Thanks a lot.